You know, there's nothing like having people in your corner praying for you, cheering you on, and your pastors have been that for me and my husband. And Sheila personally has taught me many things. And often when I am going through a difficult situation, I picture Pastor Sheila on this stage telling me to put on my big girl panties. Anybody else? But recently, in the, uh, in the, I have a newfound respect for Pastor Sheila, and that is now because I have a teenager. And if you have little kids, if you don't have teenagers yet, if you have little kids, little kids are gross. I mean, they're smelly, and they're messy, and they're emotional, and they don't listen. But let me tell you, they go to bed relatively early. They might not sleep, but they're in there. And they also take a nap, like, you know, at least a couple days a week. Teenagers, they are also smelly. They are also messy. They are also emotional. They do not listen, and they're bigger than you, and they don't sleep. <laughs> and Jody and Sheila, when I look at you guys, I, I have hope. Um, <laughs> I have hope that I'm going to survive. And so are my children. I'm not going to kill them. And um, these two women that lead you, they are the real deal. And they love each other. And they love you. So would you help me honor them tonight just really quick before I get started? Will you just, we love you. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Thank you for who you are to all of us. We really appreciate you. All right. Thank you, band. You guys are amazing. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Holly Furtick, and I'm married to my best friend. His name is Stephen Furtick, and many of you have been touched by his sermons and his songs. I'm getting a little bit of feedback up here. Is, is, that, is it sound okay to you guys? Okay. Um, so, but Stephen Furtick, he's not only an amazing preacher, an amazing songwriter, but he is my partner in crime. And um, to raising our children, Elijah, Graham, and Abby, there's a, a picture of my family. And Abby is here with me tonight. This is her first time. Abby, run up here and wave to everybody. I don't have a mic for her, but... So... Um, this is Abby's first time in the Pacific Northwest, and um, I was telling her all about why it rains in Seattle all the time. And, um, and I have to tell you the sweetest thing about Abby when we, when we got here. She pulled a lint brush out of her purse, and she said, I thought you might need this because you were wearing black. So Abby's my little armor bearer. <laughs> say hi, just say hi, my Michael pick you up. Say hi, everybody. Hi. <laughs> all right, you can do it. So my husband and I, we have a really great marriage. And one of the things that we do to keep our marriage strong is we try not to have any secrets. Good, good rule of thumb, right, in marriage, not to have any secrets. But um, would you agree that occasionally in marriage, it's okay to withhold a little bit of information from your spouse? <laughs> so for instance, um, I don't want my husband to know that I don't mind doing dishes. Um, <laughs> for obvious reasons, because <laughs> I still want him to help me do the dishes, but I don't mind doing the dishes because I actually love loading the dishwasher. Anybody in here love loading? I, I think it's because it's like a puzzle, you know? It's like a challenge. Um, Tetris is the only video game that I was ever good at. I just aged myself by telling you that. I'm the big ga gray Game Boy. Anybody? And, uh, this is a women's conference. We're not really into video games. Anybody hate Fortnite? Okay. So anyway, um, I love to load the dishwasher because I, I love the puzzle. My husband, he doesn't love puzzles. He's not good at them at all. And um, he does not like to use the dishwasher. He'd rather just hand wash everything. He grew up in one of those houses where they had a dishwasher, but they didn't use it. Anybody? Something about his dad didn't want it to wear out or he thought that it didn't work good or I don't know. Um, so there's this thing that happens to me all of the time 
in our house, um, many nights I will load the dishwasher after dinner, and in my heart, I will know I should just put the soap in and turn it on. But my mind is telling me to wait because I have young boys in my house and they're always hungry. They eat constantly. And so I know inevitably somebody is going to come back into my clean kitchen and they're going to have a bowl of cereal or a bowl of ramen noodles and they're going to leave their... And I just, you know, when I, want to, when I go to bed, I just like knowing that all the dishes are being cleaned magically in this machine. And so I will wait. And I don't know when I'm going to learn my lesson because I always forget. And then the next morning, I will open up the dishwasher. And it's, guys, it's always on the night when we had salmon. <laughs> and I'll open up the dishwasher. And I, I know this is silly and you're probably thinking like, what's her point? And Pastor Stephen is a lot funnier than this. And, um, <laughs> But tonight, I want to talk to you about a different kind of cycle, not a dishwasher cycle, but I want to talk to you about the hope cycle. That's my title for tonight. And if you have a Bible, would you turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 5? If you don't have a Bible, no problem. I think they're going to have it up here on the screens for you. But Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Paul tells us, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Let's pray, Father. We thank you for this gathering of women. What a beautiful night this has been. And right now, we just open up our hearts. We ask that you would speak to us tonight, and we will obey. We love you, Lord. Thank you. Speak through me. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm just going to teach a little bit tonight. I thought I would go back to my elementary ed roots. I have a degree in elementary ed. I taught fifth grade for one year and seventh grade for two years, and then I was out. But... Um, <laughs> When I was reading this passage of scripture, this idea, this cycle of hope just really leapt off the page for me, and I want to draw it out for you. I've got a couple different colors here. Let me pick a girly color. Um, so Paul tells us in Romans chapter 5, he tells us that we hope in the glory of God. Let's just draw it like really big. Paul tells us that we hope in the glory of God, but then he also tells us that we can glory in our suffering. Look how fun this is. Okay, don't judge me if my handwriting isn't good or if I spell something wrong. You would be nervous if you were writing in front of all these people too. So we hope in the glory of God, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering leads to Perseverance. Okay, and then perseverance. Character. And then one version of the Bible says, and character leads us back to hope. This is the hope cycle. So, Oh, look, I changed the tops. How cute is that? Okay. <laughs> so we start out with hope. And all of us as believers in Christ, we have this hope. But this is not a generic hope. It's not a hope that our situation will change or that maybe our spouse will change or that your health will improve. Those are all good things to hope for. But Romans 5 is not talking about this generic hope. Romans 5 is talking about that we hope in the glory of God. This is where Paul later talks about in Romans 8, 28. Any of you know that verse? The verse that says that all things work together for the good of those who love of God who are called according to his purpose. So this is that belief that God is taking everything that happens to me, every suffering, every disappointment, 
every mistake and he's working it for his good. This is what I can hope in. It may not turn out the way that I thought it would. Um, I may never even get to see the good, but this is the hope that I know that God somehow is working everything for my good and for his glory. And as believers in Christ, we believe that deep down, but oftentimes we head into this season of suffering. Now, unfortunately, the one thing that is guaranteed in life is suffering. Being a follower of Jesus does not exempt you from suffering. Being a good person, being a nice person, following all of the rules does not exempt you from suffering. Suffering is a part of life, but Remember, as believers in Christ, we have this hope. So we operate under this assumption that God is working everything for our good. So Paul tells us that our suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance is when you keep going even when you don't think that you can. Have you ever been in a situation where you just had to keep putting one foot in front of the other just, just minute by minute, hour by hour? just pushing through a situation in your life. We as women, we know a lot about perseverance. I mean, we can operate under very little sleep, yeah? And we can keep going even when we're sick. Now, I can't say that for all of the sexes, but <laughs> we know a thing or two about perseverance. So for me, when I was preparing this message, um, I, I had a lot of stuff going on. I mean, it just felt, it was like one of those weeks where I was like, really God, can, can I catch a break here? I had a meeting at the school for one of my children and then another one of my children started throwing up. And um, this child actually threw up all over the bathroom floor and um, I, was, I was exercising, I have a Peloton bike. Anybody have a Peloton bike? Love my Peloton bike. So I was on my bike, Abby comes downstairs and she's like, mom, Graham threw up all over the bathroom floor and it is gross. <laughs> so I go upstairs and um, let me just tell you, um, we have our air conditioning vents in the floor of our house. It was gross. And then I had another child who was having breathing issues and, and I'm giving breathing treatments and I'm cleaning up throw up and I'm working on a sermon. And you know, we, we all have days and we have weeks where we have to keep going even when we're sick, even when we're struggling. Because how many of you know your bills don't just pay themselves? Life doesn't stop just because I'm going through a difficult season. But that's the beauty of perseverance, is that I get to find out how strong I really am. You get to tap into this strength that you didn't know was even there. And then perseverance leads us to character. Just as you get on the other side of this trial, you realize I'm stronger than I was before before my suffering, I'm, 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 I'm a little bit wiser. Maybe, maybe you're kinder. Maybe you're more compassionate because God has sustained you. He's gotten you through something and now you have more hope. This is the hope cycle. Several years ago, I endured one of these cycles because our local news in Charlotte, North Carolina, decided to run a series of stories on my husband and on our church. And I was so hurt because the things that they were reporting were exaggerated and then a lot of it was simply not true. And I don't know if you know the feeling of when you find out that somebody has been saying things about you that aren't true. Well, imagine if they put it on the news. And um, so these stories, it wasn't just one story, because when the first one ran, I was like, oh, this is really, but they kept going. I mean, this, this reporter just kept running stories on and off for months. And I remember waking up in the morning and, and opening my eyes and realizing that the nightmare was a reality. Do you know that feeling when you, when you open your eyes and immediately the anxiety just sets in and you remember what you're going through? And just when I would think, what else could they report about us? We're not, we're not like that interesting. 
they would run another story. And then the newspaper would pick it up. And then people would start commenting. And the, the comments, y'all, stop commenting. <laughs> My mother taught me, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say anything at all. The comments were so hurtful. And so I remember um, around my husband's birthday, his birthday's in February, we were watching the opening ceremony for the Olympics. And the news kept running this teaser. I will never forget it. Every commercial break, because you know, they're trying to get you to stay on and watch the evening news. Every commercial break, it would say this. Stephen Furtick, pastor of local megachurch and New York Times best-selling author, or is he? And the story was suggesting that my husband had cheated his way onto the New York Times list. And this was so devastating for me because I was hurt for our church members who were hearing these things. I was hurt for my husband who had not only not cheated to get onto the New York Times bestseller list, he actually gave up sales so that he could sell his book to, at a discounted rate to our church members. And it was absolutely crushing as a wife to, to watch my husband's integrity come into question. And he never defended himself. He just kept ministering to people. So at different points throughout this season in my life, because you know, sometimes this cycle, you have no idea when it's going to end. It just keeps going, you know? <laughs> so at different points during this season, I remember early on driving to church and wondering if people were gonna come to church. And I remember not wanting to walk my children into school because I didn't know what people thought about me. And I remember not wanting to play tennis on my tennis team because I, I just was afraid to be around people. I was afraid to go to the grocery store. I didn't, I, I didn't know if people hated me or loved me. Or I, it, was, it was just such a difficult time for me and I was suffering. But you know what I did? I walked my kids into school with my head held high. I don't know how, but I did. I just, I kept going. And I played tennis. Now, I'm not good at tennis, but that had nothing to do with the situation that was going on. But I kept going, and I kept being around people, and I kept going to church. And I remember feeling God's presence with me, almost as if, almost as if it was tangible, almost as if it was something real. There's a, there's a Bible verse in Psalms that says, He covers you with His feathers. That was how I felt in this season. And I remember the promises that God spoke to me. There was just this source of strength that was there that I experienced in this time of suffering through this perseverance. Did God cause that reporter to write all of that stories about us? No way, I don't, I don't believe that. But did God use that situation to build in me endurance? Absolutely, he was building my character. That situation forced me to place our church and our ministry and my family and my reputation in his hands. And I stand before you today stronger and wiser. I never read comments anymore, that's for sure. <laughs> so every time that this cycle begins again, because it will, I go into it stronger and I go into it more hopeful. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we only had to handle one cycle at a time? But the reality is, let's go for purple. The reality is that we have many cycles going on simultaneously and they can be all different sizes. So maybe you have uh, this, this large circle, maybe it represents for you something big in your life, something ongoing, maybe a health issue, or your marriage is falling apart, or um, your job, or whatever. This is like a, a big, a big one, okay? But also, at the same time, maybe you have um, a bill that you don't know how you're going to pay, or maybe one of your children is struggling in school this year. They're just, they're just not clicking with their teacher. They're not doing well. They're not, they're struggling and they're academic. So you've got this issue going on with your kids. And maybe you have like a little one, like one that only lasts a couple hours, like you have to clean up throw up all over the floor, right? 
Just a little one. Just right, yuck. <laughs> um, maybe you have a relationship challenge in your life, a friendship or an in-law or something. I'm just going to write friend that you just are struggling with. Or maybe you're a student and um, you have a class that you're taking and you don't know how you're going to pass. I, I don't know how I passed physical science in college. It was truly a miracle of God. Um, <laughs> but remember, each trial, each problem or, or suffering is running the cycle. And each one is building your perseverance and building your character. But they're not only building in and of itself, they're feeding into one another. So maybe from this situation, this bill, you learn self-control. You learn, I've got a budget, or this is not gonna happen. So you learn self-control and it's feeding into your situation. And maybe in this situation, you learn that you've got to pray Pray your child through this situation. Maybe you learn when to keep your mouth shut and when to speak up for your kid. So that's feeding into your situation. And maybe, maybe this one momentary thing, you're like, well, I can do hard things. It wasn't that bad. I mean, it was really gross, but I can do hard things. And, and so that's feeding into your situation. Maybe with your friend, you learn the power of an apology. And so you're building your care. Maybe with this class, you learn discipline. All of these things are feeding into each other and they're feeding into now I'm in this big situation, but my hope is built up. My hope is stronger. And I don't know how I'm going to make it through this one, but I know I made it through before and my hope is stronger. I almost called this sermon, thank you, next. What I want you to know today is that you've got to run the cycle. Don't get stuck in the suffering stage. The more that you lean into this process, the more that you can gain from it. When you are going through a difficult time, sometimes I just pray, God, you know what? I don't know why this is happening, but I want everything that you have for me from this situation. There are a few things that will break your cycle really fast. One of those things is comparison. Sometimes when you're going through suffering, you feel all of these feelings and you start to compare yourself. Well, nobody understands my situation. Nobody's ever hurt this bad before. Nobody's, no, nobody, nobody cares about me. Sometimes we go into a complaining where we think, why is this happening? Why me? Really? I mean, I'm a good person. I, I can't do this. This is too hard. Sometimes we blame. There's something that in, in our minds that we just, we want a reason for why we're suffering. And so the easiest thing to do is say, well, if my husband hadn't done what he had, I wouldn't be in this situation. Or if my parents had fed me healthier food, then I wouldn't struggle with my weight or whatever. We just, we want to find someone to put the blame on. Or have you been, ever been angry? Just angry at God? Why did God let this happen to me? What God, I just, I can't, when you can't wrap your mind around a situation, you start to feel all of these feelings. And you know what? These things are valid ways for you to feel when you're suffering. And some days when you're suffering, that's where you are. And, you, and, and your pain, it's real. Pain is a real thing and you're gonna wanna numb and you're gonna wanna stay there and you're gonna wanna blame and you're gonna wanna be angry. But here's the thing, those attitudes will get you stuck. And if you stay there too long, it's okay if you feel those things, but if you stay there too long, you will become bitter and you will stink like the dishwasher. <laughs> These things, when you stay here, you prolong the process of what God wants to do in your life. Complaining cost Israel 40 extra years in the desert. It was a two week journey that ended up being 40 years because they couldn't run the cycle. Don't let those dishes, don't let those feelings sit. I know what it feels like to not want to get out of bed and continue fighting a situation that feels like this is never going to end. I know what it feels like, and I know you've been here too, to have this wave of anxiety wash over you where you just have to go into the bathroom in order to make it through that moment. I know what it feels like to not want to come to church because I don't want to look anybody in the eyes. I don't want anybody to see my pain. 
but I know from experience, and I'm telling you, that stopping here only delays the process and keeps what God has for me in my situation. So just like there are some things that will slow down your cycle, there are also some things that will give your cycle momentum. One of those things is church. You're here. This is the best place that you can be. Maybe you were a little bit put off by a pastor's wife standing up in front of you and saying that I didn't sometimes don't want to go to church. I hope that that encourages you, though, to know that it's totally normal to feel like that. Sometimes it's just a struggle to get yourself here. The pull is always going to be for you to stay home. Don't get dressed. You can't see people. You can't face people. But would anyone in here agree with me that if you can just get here, if you can just get here, God will meet you here. I know there are some days where the best thing you can do, the only thing you can do is open up your computer and watch online, and I get it, but there is something special about coming together with a body of believers and getting your faith together in this environment, and I can pull from her faith, and I can pull from his faith. If you can just get here, God will speak to you, and he'll give you that word that you need to just take that next step. Another thing that will give you momentum is having the right voices in your life. Sometimes the last thing that you want to do when you're going through a situation is tell somebody. Maybe you feel shame. Maybe you feel like um, nobody can understand. Or maybe you just don't even want to talk about it. I've been through some situations like that. And I can tell you that the times where I pushed through and I opened up to a friend, it's counterintuitive because when you're suffering, your instinct is to withdraw. Your instinct is to stay home, stay away. But when you're here and you open yourself up to someone and you're vulnerable with a person that you trust, you experience an intimacy and a communion that you cannot experience when everything is great and everything is awesome. There's some special things that happen when you're here. And there are some people that God has placed in your life, maybe even in this room right now, whose words can be life to you in your situation, whose words can get you through if you'll just lean in to the pain. Another one, this one's kind of small, it seems small, but it's huge for me, is worship music. Have you ever had a song that got you through a situation? I know Pastor Sheila loves worship music. She's addicted to worship music. She calls it praise and worship. And um, she'll text me and she'll be like, I'm watching praise and worship. It's so good, we love Elevation. But there are some songs that have really gotten me through. Do you know, do you know the song Unstoppable God? A, do you sing that here? So we sing that all the time at our church and that was an anthem for me. That was a song that really got me through all of that media stuff and that season in my life. Um, do you ever sing the song, um, Do It Again? I love that song. I mean, we can sing these songs thousands of times, but I still, I'll tear up. I'll actually, every time they play Unstoppable God in my church, and I'm telling you, we've sang that song a thousand times at our church. You'd think that I'd be numb to, to that song by now. Every time I tear up because I can remember the promises that God spoke to me. Songs, songs are like a smell. Have you ever had a smell trigger a memory? Songs can trigger a memory. And in that moment, all, all of a sudden, I can feel the pain from that situation, but then I can feel the joy and the presence of God. You've got to get a song that will get you through You've got to run the cycle. Don't, don't stay stuck here and, and let those things carry you through. Use the momentum of a friend. Use the momentum of a song to carry you through. There's a story in John chapter 9 um, that I just love. It's a story where Jesus heals the man who was born blind. And I love John because John gives a lot of detail. He gives lots of extra details that the other gospels don't give. I love details. Um, my dream is for my husband to look me in the eyes and say, Holly, do not leave one detail out of this story. Tell me everything. I'm still waiting. 
But anyway, John, he, he has that epic talk style, and so he gives us a lot of details. I'm not going to read the whole chapter. If you have time tomorrow, sometime, tonight, read this story. It is full of so many details and so much good stuff. But anyway, John chapter 9, I'm going to read a couple of verses to you. It says, as he, talking about Jesus, um, went along, he saw a blind man from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind? You see, we're just like the disciples. We want an answer. We want an, who, who's, whose fault is this, Jesus? What happened here? Was it, was it his parents? Was it the man who sinned? And Jesus looks back at them and he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. See, Jesus is trying to tell them, stop trying to explain everything away. God cannot be constrained by our formulas. He is so much bigger than our cause and effect. Because remember, we want answers. We want everything to have a place. We want to understand. But God is saying, take your eyes off of this suffering and remember that your hope is in the glory of God. Ann Voskamp says it this way. She says, my darkness becomes a, a canvas for his light. So Jesus is walking by, he sees this blind man, and he bends down, and he spits in the dirt, and he makes some mud. Now, there's so much to this story, but there's one tradition that says that when people would pass by the man, that they would often spit on the ground near him, because they believed that if you were born blind, then you were cursed, like the disciples said. Well, so obviously something went wrong here, and they didn't want that curse to fall onto them. So they would spit as like a sign of, 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 of rejection of that curse coming on them. And so here's this man, and he hears this familiar sound, this, this sound of rejection. Only Jesus isn't there to reject him. Jesus is there to heal him and to accept him. And so he makes some mud and he puts the mud on the man's eyes and he says, go and wash. And the Bible tells us that the man went and washed and then he went home seeing. Cycle ended, right? The man was suffering, Jesus healed him, and he goes home seeing, everybody's gonna have a party, right? No. The man comes home seeing, and his neighbors start questioning him, and questioning each other, like, is this the guy? And, or they're saying, who opened your eyes? And so the man says to them, the man, they called Jesus, open my eyes. And they say, well, where is he? The man's like, I never saw him. <laughs> Don't even know what he looks like. So the people of the town, the Bible is funny. If you'll just read it, there's some really great stuff in there. So the people of the town, they're upset because Jesus had healed the man on the Sabbath. So never mind that this guy was born blind and now he can see. It's not good enough because he was healed on the wrong day. And they're upset about this. So they take him to the Pharisees because they were afraid. Really, they weren't trying to um, you know, be cruel to him. They were afraid because the Pharisees had been throwing people out of the synagogue who believed in Jesus. And so they knew if they were associated with this man and associated with his, this, his healing, that they too might be thrown out of the synagogue, which would be like being cast out from your community. And so they take this man before the Pharisees and the Pharisees, they just start drilling him. And then they bring in his parents and even his parents don't defend him. His parents say, he's a grown man. Why are you asking us? Ask him. <laughs> the, the poor guy. I mean, have you ever felt like you came, you came out of one victory just to go right back into something else? The man was blind and he can see, he deserves a party and he gets an inquisition. And so he gets an attitude, which is really cool. I really love it. He kind of gets an attitude with the Pharisees. Like he's like, I've been cast out from you guys my whole life. I can see, I really don't care what you think about me. And he, you know, he says, and he's like, I don't know if Jesus is a sinner or not. All I know is that I was blind and now I can see. And so the Pharisees, they cast him out. Here he is again, cast out from society alone. And guess who comes to him? Jesus. Jesus finds him and he comes to him 
and he asks him a question. Because sometimes we have to stop asking all of our questions. We have to let Jesus do the asking. So look what happens in verse 35. It says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and when he found him, isn't it great to know that we serve a God who finds us? He seeks us out. He doesn't leave us out there wandering around blind physically or emotionally or spiritually. He comes to us and he asks us a question. And here's what he said to the man. He said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Now, as I was preparing for this message, I was reading this commentary. And what I read just made all of this come together for me. And and here's what I read. It said that when Jesus was asking the man, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He wasn't saying, do you believe that I'm the Messiah? He was simply asking him, do you trust me? And that's the question that I believe that God wants to ask you today. Do you trust him? He wants you to stop asking all of your questions and listen to him. Do you trust him? My husband says it this way. He always says everything better than me. Um, But he, um, he says, do I believe that while God may not fix it, he's going to fix something in me? And he's going to do something through me. Remember, as believers in Christ, we're not exempt from this. But we have a special hope. Hebrews 6.18 tells us, take hold of this hope. It is an anchor for your soul. Paul tells us in Colossians 1.27, I think I have this verse up here for you. It says, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, I may not be able to hope that people will change, I may not be able to hope that I can get a new job or that my situation is even going to change. It's not a question of can God change the situation? That's the wrong question to ask. The question is, do I trust him? He's never failed me yet. He came through all of these times before. So when I was thinking about bringing this message to you, I was thinking about a friend of mine who is walking through a really big one. And I mean, she's just right here in this suffering stage and her pain is raw. And I was wondering, would this message be encouraging to her? Because you know, when someone is suffering, they don't wanna hear, oh, you just need to trust God. (laughs) When you are here and you are in intense pain, You don't want to be told, oh, honey, you just need to persevere. God's building your character. (laughs) You can't even, you can't even see how anything good is possibly going to come from this situation. And that's okay. If you're there and you're in that place where you're hurting so bad, you can't even imagine getting through the next minute. It's okay. And, and I'm sorry. I'm so sorry that you're going through the pain and the suffering that you're going through. And I don't know why this happened. And, and I don't know whose fault it is. And I don't know how long it's going to last. I wish I did. But I can tell you this. I know that God is going to be with you every step of the way through this process. He will never leave you. Never, no, never. He is there when you feel him, and he's there when you don't feel, feel, feel him. He comes to you in the midst of your pain. And he's the hope that you can cling to when you have nothing to hold on to. He's that anchor. Just don't let go of that. He's there with you, right beside you. And don't ever think for one second that you're alone. I want to close this message um, a little bit differently. Maybe you've done something like this before, maybe you haven't, but remember that I said that um, being in the right place with the right people when you're suffering is, is the best place that you can be. And so I want us to take advantage of that tonight. I want you to remember that you're not alone. I want you to see and feel that you are not alone.
because there's something very special about when a group of women get together like this. And this, what I'm gonna ask you to do might be a little bit uncomfortable, but you can do it, okay? Um, if you'll just trust me, I think God's gonna speak to you in this moment. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to gather into groups of two or three, don't do it yet, but gather into groups of two or three, and I want you to quickly share with somebody a situation that you're going through that you would like prayer for. And then I want you to pray for each other. Because I want you to remember that healing often comes through honesty and vulnerability. So as you're thinking about what you're gonna say, I want you to be brave. And I want you to share something hard. Don't share the easy thing, share the hard thing. And minister to each other in this moment. The band's gonna play softly. Um, and you guys are going to get to talk and pray. Just take a few minutes. And when you hear them singing, that's your cue. Because I know sometimes some of you are like me and you have a lot to say. It's okay. When you hear them singing, that's your cue to wrap it up. Okay? So the mute, when it's instrumental, keep going. When they start singing, wrap it up. And then um, Pastor Jody's going to come and she's going to close us out. So let me pray really quick and then you guys can pair up. Lord, I thank you for this message. I thank you for this moment. And I pray that you would help us to be brave in this moment and you would help us to share and that you would meet us right here and you would help us to remember and see that we are not alone and that there are people here to help us through our suffering and our pain and to pray us through and that you are here with us in this moment. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Find a buddy. Thank you so much for joining us online. Here's what we would love for you to do. Click on the logo on your screen to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Every week we're uploading our messages, bonus content, and even some videos that are guaranteed to make you laugh. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.